Welcome in to your PFF State of the Franchise. It is your Miami Dolphins edition. Sam, the Dolphins have had a lot of turnover this offseason. Some interesting moves because big names are out from Jarvis Landry to Indomitian Sue to Mike Pouncey up front. But a lot of other names coming in from Danny Amendola to Albert Wilson at wide receiver, Josh Sitton at guard. A lot of turnover. What do you make from a broad perspective of this Miami offseason? Yeah, this has one of the highest uh, percentages of roster turnover of any team in free agency so far. And I think, you know, overall, they've kind of stood still. It's a lateral move. They've shipped out a lot of people. They've brought in a lot of people. I don't know that they've been dramatically worse or better at the end of all these moves. All right, let's start with Sue because he's the big-name guy. Uh, they signed him three years ago, and uh, I don't know if Miami fans think that he was a disappointment, but we certainly disagree with that whole aspect of it. I mean, he's had two of his highest, his two highest grades uh, of his career took place in Miami over these last couple of years. He was a disruptor against the run. Uh, still a very efficient pass rusher, and they're just not getting any younger on that defensive line. But Sue moves on. Was this always just in the cards when they signed that massive deal a couple years ago? Yeah, this is all about the contract, and it was from the moment he signed that contract, it was going to become a problem squeezing that franchise salary cap until they got rid of him, and that's really what happened. Short of becoming J.J. Watt or Aaron Donald, Sue did everything he could possibly have done to justify the contract he signed. He was a better player in Miami than he ever was in Detroit. He was a dominant pass rusher, a dominant run defender, just wasn't quite good enough to make all that money worth it for the Dolphins. And eventually they got what they could out of him and decided the contract was just too much to, to bear for the salary cap going forward, so they've let him go. I think it was a move that was ultimately always coming. Um, and, you know, Sue did what he could. He was a fantastic player but will always be judged in the light of that monster contract that he signed. So that leaves a defensive line where they, so they, br they bring in Robert Quinn from the Los Angeles Rams, a guy who's had his two worst grades of his career yeah. the last couple of years, but still worth perhaps a reclamation project there. Cameron Wake still going on the other side. And they re-signed William Hayes, who's uh, always like our most underrated signing every single year. Like, hey, good job bringing back William Hayes. He's a real underrated player, but... He's also in his early 30s and getting up there in age, so they could definitely use some youth on the edge. Definitely. William Hayes, I think, is a good player. Um, and, you know, he's, he's never probably going to become a great player, similar to Robert Ayers in Tampa Bay in terms of a guy who's just perennially underrated but can be a really good member of your defensive line. He's had six seasons that are in and around 80 in terms of PFF grade. Five of his six have been above 80. And last season, okay, he missed a lot of time injured, but that was his career best grade in terms of efficiency when he was actually on the field. So he's an important player to sign for that rotation. Robert Quinn, the question is, can he rediscover anything like the form he had a few years ago now that he's going back to a 4-3 defense where, if nothing else, he gets to put his hand in the dirt again, coil, you know, spring off the defensive line, make, take advantage of that first step, which was everything for him when he was generating so much pressure. I don't know that a 3-4 these days makes that much difference given how those guys line up from a defensive line technique standpoint, but it does take your hand out of the ground and you know, take, a, take that advantage of the first step out of the equation for some guys that are all about that initial get off of the line. So maybe we'll see Quinn try and improve on those 38 total pressures he had a year ago, but they'll need him to, otherwise that really doesn't look like a great move. Yeah, so they drafted Charles Harris in the first round last year and they're expecting him to uh, emerge and play quite a bit on that defensive line. Let's go to the offensive side now with Jarvis Landry out, and he's one of the more polarizing players yeah. in the entire NFL because he has the worst athleticism numbers, just doesn't, doesn't wow anybody, has a lot of inefficient receptions, you know, short three- and four-yard passes, but um, he does, you know, create after the catch, and he's a pretty solid slot receiver, but they're going to replace him with Danny Amendola coming in from New England, Albert Wilson coming in from the Kansas City Chiefs. It's not, uh, it's not an exciting wide receiver core from the Dolphins, but a lot of guys that, you know, could stick and make for a well-rounded receiving core for Ryan Tannehill. Yeah, I mean, the thing about Landry is you have to understand what kind of receiver he is. Right. He is an underneath... Um, moving the chains type of receiver in that Wes Welker mold, in that Amendola mold. He's a guy that can exploit the, the zones underneath, exploit man coverage underneath, breaks a lot of tackles after the catch. But the way of summing up Landry is if it's first and 10, he's going to get you seven yards. If it's third and 15, he's still going to get you seven yards. So right. you just have to understand what you're getting there and don't ask him to do what he's not equipped to do. And that, that I think is a lot of uh, his detractors' biggest problem is that he, he's just a one-trick pony. That's fine. You just need to make sure you're only using him 
<laughs> with that one trick. Amendola, I think, can be a like-for-like -like replacement. They're not quite the same player, but he can do a lot of the same stuff. Wilson, I think, is a little more diverse. He can play outside. He can stretch the field vertically in a way Amendola and Landry really can't. I think overall, given what they would have needed to commit to keep Jarvis Landry, that's, that's an upgrade. It's getting cheaper and, and bringing in two players. Yeah, so they, add, they get added to the mix with Devontae Parker, Kenny Stills out there on the outside. Let's talk about this offensive line. We've got Daniel Kilgore coming into play center, replacing Mike Pouncey, and then Josh Sitton. We'll talk about his greatness in a second. But with Kilgore replacing Mike Pouncey from a name standpoint, not exciting. But when you look at Pouncey's play the last couple of years, it has not been great. Big name, production has not been good from Pouncey or anyone on that interior offensive line for the Dolphins the last couple of years. Yeah, those two guys coming in, I think, should solidify this offensive line to a significant degree, especially if that allows uh, Laramie Tunsil at left tackle to actually start playing better, you know, discover his own form or his own ceiling independent of poor play inside of him. I think that's a big help. Um, Kilgore, I think, has been a solid center, nothing more, but solid at this point would be a dramatic upgrade for this Dolphins offensive line. Josh Sitton, though, is the guy that could be the really exciting signing because, okay, he's missed time injured the last couple of seasons, but he still played, you know, a season and a half's worth of time, I guess, in those two seasons, and he is the best pass-blocking guard in the entire National Football League, allowed just 18 total pressures over those previous two seasons. 44 total, 44 guards allowed more than those 18 pressures wow. last year alone. So that is a dramatic upgrade when it comes to pass protection for this offensive line. And we know that the run blocking with the Dolphins has also been pretty horrendous when it comes to those interior three. Um, they're also adding Frank Gore at running back, the potential future Hall of Famer, Sam, with his high volume play. I don't think it's an exciting move, but Gore's always just been a solid, efficient running back. Yeah, that's exactly what he is. He is a solid addition to that backfield. He will generate you the yardage that is there to be gotten, and then a little bit more. He's a good player, a decent ad, even at this advanced stage of his career. And your boy Kenyon Drake still over there coming Dominated. off of uh, an excellent 2017 season. Let's look forward to the draft a little bit. We talked about youth and what they need on that defensive line. What about our boy Maurice Hurst? Even though we see him as a top five or top 10 pick, if he's sitting there at number 11 overall where the, where the Dolphins are picking, is he just that perfect penetrating three technique that they need on this D-line? I mean, he would replicate what Ndamukong Sue brought to this team, but do it on a rookie contract with it isn't squeezing right. your franchise. So that for them, I think, would be a dream situation. If Maurice Hurst was there in the draft where they're picking, they should run that card up to the podium and get him on the roster as soon as they can. I think the other name to watch, Roquan Smith, the linebacker out of Georgia. Feels like the Dolphins have been looking for that athletic chase and run linebacker for a couple of years now. Keep an eye on Roquan. A couple different ways that the Dolphins can go. So a lot of turnover this offseason. Any other positions you would hit for the, uh, for the draft for Miami? I don't think this is a great roster, so I think they could target pretty much any position and be in good shape. You know, they're high enough that they could go for one of those top offensive line prospects. If a guy like Quentin Nelson falls that far because of yes. all the quarterback magic in front of him, the guard out of Notre Dame, potentially the best player in the entire draft, but could wind up falling to 11 because he's a guard. Team him with Josh Sitton, and you've suddenly got a, a dramatically improved interior offensive line. Yeah, maybe the worst guard situation in the NFL all of a sudden becomes one of the best. Uh, Miami's in a good spot, sitting at number 11, hoping all of the quarterbacks go off the board, or maybe they hope that Baker Mayfield falls to them as well. We shall see. Uh, Dolphins can go any which way in the draft. Exciting turnover this offseason in Miami, but I think they're putting the pieces together as long as they have a good draft to turn things around. That is your Miami Dolphins state of the franchise powered by PFF Elite.